Fighting Blindness Canada's Viewpoint is a virtual education series that brings you the latest in vision research presented by health experts from across Canada. The webinar you're about to watch is a recording. To learn more about the research we fund and upcoming webinars and events, please visit our website at fightingblindness.ca. This Viewpoint webinar is proudly presented by Bayer and supported by Novartis, Allergan, Janssen, Biogen, AGTC, Miara GTX, and the SickKids Foundation. We'd also like to thank Accessible Media Inc., our national accessibility partner. Everyone should download the AMI app, which is a fabulous resource. And you can watch excellent programming, including previous Fighting Blindness Canada events. Thank you for watching. We hope you enjoy this webinar and share your thoughts with us in the comment section below. So with that, I'm going to turn it over uh, to Dr. Safaya, who is the director of the Neurovascular Eye Disease Lab at the Mason D. Rosemont Hospital Research Center. And he holds the Wolf Professorship in Translational Vision Research and the Canadian Research Chair in Retinal Cell Biology. It's quite impressive mouthful. <laughs> He's also an associate professor at University of Montreal and an adjunct professor at McGill University. So I will uh, turn it over to you. Oh, I think you're on mute still. Yes, I was, sorry. Um, so thank you very much for, uh, for the invitation. It's, it's always a pleasure to, uh, to, to take part in these events that are, are very important. So um, I'm wondering if I could share my screen, if you can give me um, sharing rights. Oh, they're not letting you, oh, sorry. Here we go, you should be able to go now. Okay, let's try that. Is, is that sharing now? Okay, I think, are you seeing like a double screen right now or? No, it's perfect. We can see the, the slides. Yeah, okay. it's just the slide, yeah. Do you see two slides or one slide? One slide. Okay, good, that's, that's the way it should be. Okay, so <clears throat> I, I was asked today to talk about um, some of the work that we did that was um, entirely sponsored by uh, what was back then the Foundation Fighting Blindness Canada. Um, so I'm extremely grateful to support um, obtained by um, Fighting Blindness Canada now um, that helps us uh, conduct some of this work. So essentially the, the main thing that the laboratory is interested in is trying to understand how a healthy retina with a pretty stereotyped vasculature um, becomes a retina that has problems with the vasculature. And this is what happens in some of the main causes of blindness or loss of sight in the Western world or the industrialized uh, countries. So essentially there are three main diseases that are quite different from one another. So the origin of the vascular disease differs, um, but the, the, the final culminating point has some resemblance. And I'll talk about that uh, a bit later. So essentially these three diseases um, affect people across life. So the first one being retinopathy of prematurity. So this occurs when infants are born anywhere between 25 to 32 weeks of age. And when they uh, come out of the womb, their, the blood vessels in their eyes, so in their retina, aren't yet mature or formed. And so there's all sorts of complications that ensue because of that. And one of them is that um, because there's no actual blood vessels in the periphery of the retina, uh, new blood vessels start to sprout to compensate for, for those zones where there are no blood vessels, but they, they no longer adhere to, to the molecular programs that you would have during normal development in the wound, in the womb. So essentially what happens is that they end up growing in a very disorganized fashion and they're leaky um, and they end up growing in zones that typically you wouldn't have blood vessels. And what can happen there is those blood vessels can actually tear the back of the eye or tear the retina off. So kind of similar to what might happen in certain advanced cases of uh, diabetic retinopathy, which is of course the leading cause of blindness in, in working age populations. 
and here for a much different reason, so um, hyperglycemia, so essentially too much sugar in your blood, um, ends up compromising the, the integrity of a, of a cell that lines the inside of the blood vessels called the endothelial cell and cells that are outside of the blood vessels that are kind of muscular cells called parasites. And so once those cells start to, to disorganize themselves and die out, um, we start to see leakiness into the retina. So there's a swelling of the retina. And um, as a, eventually those blood vessels die out. And then again, the, the retina, like any tissue, wants to compensate for the lack of oxygen or nutrients. So it starts to produce new blood vessels. So much like in the first case of retinopathy of prematurity, here we have, again, new uh, blood vessels. It's called neovascularization. And this occurs to, to kind of overcome or as a consequence of the fact that the first normal set of blood vessels either didn't form or died out. Now, the, the last disease, and this is the one that I'll be um, talking about the, for the rest of, uh, of the session today, is age-related macular degeneration. So, and particularly, I'll be talking about the wet form. So what, what happens in age-related macular degeneration? So there, there are two distinct forms that are likely a continuum. Um, and essentially, uh, one of them is called the dry form, and one of them is called the wet form, so or exit form. And what happens in the dry form is with age, there starts to be um, a loss of efficiency to clear um, certain deposits in the back of the eye. Um, and so we end up seeing accumulation of, um, of uh, lipids and immune cells and some other cellular debris. Um, and it's no longer efficiently cleared by the back of the eye. So it accumulates. And in a certain sense, it kind of starts to uh, choke the blood vessels at the back of the eye, at the very, very back of the eye. Um, and this is a, a vascular bed called the choroid plexus. And essentially, once this vascular bed at the back of the eye um, degenerates, then once again, we have a signal that there's not enough blood vessels and there's all these new blood vessels that start to form. And this is called the wet form of uh, age-related macular degeneration uh, or the exudative, exudative form. Um, and this is, again, characterized by blood vessels that grow in a very disorganized fashion that are leaky, that invade parts of the retina where typically there are no blood vessels. And um, ultimately they, they can cause the retina to, um, to detach or to fibrose or essentially light path is compromised to, to, um, to, their, to the photoreceptors where, where uh, typically they transmit the signal to the brain. So, this is a, a disease um, that's quite of quite high prevalence. Now, when we're looking at the uh, the dry form, this is around ninety percent of all cases of age of all cases of age related macular degeneration. Um, and not not everyone who has a dry form will necessarily have um, very severe loss of sight, but the main cause of blindness in age-related macular degeneration will come from the wet form. So this is when the, the neovessels, the new blood vessels form. And so it's only 10% of cases will actually, of age-related macular degeneration will be this wet form, but that's the, the one that, um, that causes the most uh, immediate damage. Now, there's a lot of treatments that, that, can, that are coming up and that have been um, already in clinic for the last 15 years and that, that work quite well. So um, some of these are the anti-vascular uh, growth factor treatments. And essentially, these are good ways to um, mitigate some of the damage from the new blood vessels. But it would be very interesting to actually understand what happens upstream. So prior to those uh, blood pathological blood vessels or diseased blood vessels forming. So there's been an extreme amount of um, really high quality research and a lot of interest in, in trying to map out if AMD is a genetic disease. So essentially some of the first um, series of studies called uh, 
GWAS. So um, uh, these are studies where you try to find a, a gene association for uh, for a given disease. We're actually on AMD. So the, the, the first biggest GWAS was on AMD and they um, found a, a certain gene called complement factor H that is very highly um, associated with the development of AMD. Um, yet, it only increases your chance of having AMD by, by a certain fold. So meaning that if you have a mutation in this gene, it, you have more chances of developing the disease, but it doesn't mean you will develop the uh, disease. So essentially what this means is that AMD is not a disease that can be characterized by one given mutation, but there's a lot of other factors that we're still trying to understand that can actually help um, or predispose to the disease. So having one given mutation will not guarantee that you have the disease. Um, it will might increase your risks, but there are also a lot of other factors that we just don't yet understand that can predispose to this disease. Now, the best known ones um, are, of course, your age, um, your gender, and um, as I mentioned, some genetic factors. So um, essentially, if you're um, above the age of 65, that, that would be the number one risk factor for AMD. Um, then to a certain extent, um, you, you'll have certain studies that point to, to, um, to a sex difference, so where, where females will have more, more chance of developing it. Um, and also uh, smoking, um, obesity, and diet. So these are three factors that we're quite interested in because they're modifiable factors. So these are environmental factors, and some of them are relatively easy to modify. So actually, the very first one, smoking, um, highest risk factor, uh, highest environmental risk factor, very easy to modify. Well, very easy. It's at least something that can be done um, with, with enough willpower. Um, and then diet and obesity have proven to be quite, quite a bit more complicated to modify. Um, but these are factors that are important to understand and to learn from what exactly happens when uh, a, an obese individual, why an obese individual is more predisposed to developing the disease. So there's, there's been some really nice studies that came out of um, Australia a couple of years ago that showed that if you had um, a, a body mass index that was a bit higher, and especially your waist hip ratio, if it was higher, um, you can develop in males over uh, 2.3 times more uh, uh, AMD. So you had 2.3 or over two times more chances of developing AMD if you had a bigger hip to waist ratio. Um, so this kind of suggested that, you know, visceral fat deposits were, were doing something to the body over the long term that can uh, predispose to, to AMD. Now, we started asking, you know, what exactly could, what other factors or how can obesity predispose to, um, uh, to developing AMD? And this is the study that I'll be talking about for, for the, the bulk of, um, of the presentation. So we ended up publishing this paper um, a couple of years ago. And I, I think it's important to point out that um, we're not saying that a given diet is better for AMD. There are, are other uh, people that have done some really nice work pointing to, to this, but we just wanted to essentially understand what was happening um, more on a cellular level during obesity and how that can predispose to, um, to AMD. Now, of course, some of this um, work uh, ended up reaching certain media outlets and people were saying, don't eat fatty foods because fatty foods are bad for your eyes. And that's certainly not the, the message we wanted to bring across. Um, our message was really what happens to your gut once it bathes in, in a, a high fat diet. So essentially once it has a lot of excess lipids and how can that particularly influence the metabolism? So the way that, you know, the, um, the cells in your body end up reacting to this overload of, of fat. So the story started when one of um, my graduate students um, ended up making uh, mice obese by giving them high fat diets. So uh, 
this is a, a pretty straightforward approach. Essentially, what she what she does is she gives a, a diet that's very rich in certain fats uh, to mice. Mice will uh, will eat them, and then they'll become sometimes morbidly obese. Um, and this is controlled with the diet that has all the same nutrients as uh, the fat diet, except it doesn't have as much fat. So that's going to be compensated for with, with other uh, macronutrients. And then essentially, um, then you have a model where you can study what what's the outcome of obesity on, on different diseases or uh, on body composition, et cetera. So then what uh, the student did, um, and so again, this was, uh, we were trying to understand what happens uh, systemically, so to, to the gut and, and so on, um, and how can this influence to uh, a certain extent the outcome on uh, an ocular phenotype like uh, AMD. So what she did was she took the feces from these mice, from these obese mice, and fed them to mice that were uh, either skinny or mice that had received a high fat diet and were obese. Um, now, this is a, a, a might not make much sense why she took the feces and fed them, but I'll, I'll talk to that um, in a couple of uh, slides. So essentially these mice that were um, obese and were receiving um, a, a, a fecal transfer from skinny mice um, had a very interesting uh, systemic phenotype, so meaning their bodies reacted very different uh, to certain stressors, and I'll talk about that in this slide. So essentially, the first experiment we did was we took um, both types of uh, mice, so either the, uh, uh, the skinny mice or the fat mice, and then we, we did a glucose challenge test. So this is a very standard test um, where essentially Typically, if it's uh, uh, in, a, in a clinic, you'll go and drink a, a type of very uh, sugary drink, like an orange drink, and then your, um, the, your level of body glucose, so body sugar, is measured over time. And essentially, the, the quicker your body is able to deal with this, the better, then, um, meaning that you're able to respond to high glucose and, and likely you don't have diabetes or prediabetes. Uh, or so on. It means that you're able to clear boluses of, of, uh, uh, of sugar. Um, now, the fat mice, so uh, for those that uh, have the screen in front of them, uh, the, the blue line is mice that are um, fed a high fat diet. And these mice are kind of similar to what a diabetic patient would be. So essentially, they're obese and they're unable to clear uh, the glucose as readily as skinny mice. So exactly like you would see in a patient with type 2 diabetes versus a healthy patient. Now, the part that was really remarkable here was when we fed high fat diets to um, the mice and they're obese, unable to clear their glucose. Now, when we gave them just the feces from a skinny mouse, so again, we took a uh, obese mouse, fed them feces from a skinny mouse and all of a sudden um, for those that have the slide in front of you uh, we saw that those obese mice so without changing their weight at all or body composition they're all of a sudden able to manage their body glucose much better so this is extremely remarkable um, to us because we're the only thing we're doing was giving them feces essentially uh, no other intervention and we're curing their pre-diabetic or diabetic state um, and this has been actually shown before our study and, um, of course, since our study. And it, it really holds across different, different groups, different laboratories, different continents. So there's really something really important in, um, in this fecal matter that can influence the way that your whole body reacts to, um, to, to given metabolic stress. Now, this was first reported in the fourth century before Christ, when um, in, uh, in China by a, a doctor called uh, Gahang. And what he would do is in, in serious cases um, of, uh, of diarrhea or, or dysentery, uh, he came up with this idea that if he took fecal matter from a healthy individual and fed it to, um, to the sick individual that they can 
actually do much better and be cured. Um, and from there, um, years and years later, so um, essentially in the 20th century, when we started doing fecal transfers again, there was some randomized um, studies that uh, started coming out on C. difficile, so Clostridium difficile, very aggressive, very unpleasant uh, infection, uh, debilitating if, if it's sustained, uh, often caught in hospital wards. And so essentially a very, um, you know, rough treatment with an antibiotic uh, called vancomycin would reduce your, or, or had a cure rate of around 31%, which is relatively low. Whereas if you did a fecal transfer, and we can talk later about the types of protocols that are now employed for fecal transfers, but if you did a fecal transfer from a healthy um, individual, there was a, a 94% report of, uh, of, of people being healthy again or, or cured or, or uh, asymptomatic following their clostridium difficile. So this is you know, over threefold more success with the fecal transfer than with the current antibiotic treatment. So there's really something in these fecal transfers that, that's quite interesting and certainly has a very big impact on your, on your systemic health. So the most likely way that this works is by influencing something called your gut microbiota. So essentially the microbes that live in your, in your guts or your, your intestines. And essentially there's around 500 to 1,000 different species of bacterium that live in your in your body. Um, a lot of them are found in the gut. Now there's around a um, two to three times more of these bacteria than human cells in the body. Um, and they're involved right now over the last, I'd say seven, eight years. Um, it's been clear that um, these gut microbiota have uh, an impact on everything from depression to uh, to Crohn's disease, to diabetes, um, and um, our study was came out a number of years ago and showed that there was a uh, a link to age-related macular degeneration. So, one of the interesting things to note here, another reason why we started doing this study um, all these years ago, is we wanted to we got inspired by certain other genetic studies that showed that essentially twins that had AMD had um, a, a very high um, likelihood of developing AMD. So if one twin had AMD, the other one, so there was a big uh, correlation. And what we found really interesting was the, the fact that in that study, they mentioned also that people that shared living quarters, so that were genetically distinct, but shared living quarters had a very, very high incidence of AMD. So meaning there was some environmental factors that were likely very important in, in their um, developing this disease. Um, and also we now know that cohabitation um, is a great way to, to transfer microbes from one person to the other, um, including your, your pets. So essentially, if you have a dog, um, there was a nice study that came out a couple of years ago that also showed that uh, dogs and the rest of their family share a very similar micro, uh, uh, sorry, mi microbial organism on their skin. So, you know, dog comes in contact with the kids, kids come in contact with the parents or, or, or vice versa. And then there, there's this, um, um, I guess we can say symbiosis or transfer of, of microbes from one species to another. Um, so it's a very, it's, it's a factor that, you know, wasn't really considered um, as being relevant for disease maybe 10, 15 years ago. Um, but now over the last uh, decade, it's been really coming, becoming more obvious that we should be looking at this in, um, in, you know, in pretty much every single chronic disease we can think of. Now, what we did um, to, to address whether AMD could have, uh, could be influenced by gut microbiome was uh, we used uh, a model where essentially we take a mouse and we, we burn a, um, uh, a, a laser hole in the retina. And from that hole emanates a whole series of blood vessels that resemble very much, or I should say, to a certain extent, what happens in wet age-related macular degeneration. So we designed this paradigm where we had animals that were 
fed either a high fat diet or a regular diet. And then we would give them some antibiotics. So a type of antibiotic called neomycin that doesn't really permeate the gut very much. So we think most of the effect is, is local coming from the gut. Um, and by no means are we saying that antibiotics are good for AMD. Uh, this was really an experimental paradigm to, to see what would happen if we used um, antibiotics to, to essentially modify the way that uh, the gut microbiome um, or the composition of the gut microbiome. So what we found was um, uh, just using a regular diet and a high fat diet, uh, we could we did a sequencing of the uh, gut microbes and found there is these enormous discrepancies in, in different populations of microbes. So essentially, uh, we could probably explain the whole thing in a very um, general manner by saying that there's two types of families that were implicated, or at least two that we looked at. Uh, one is called the firmicates and the other one is called the bacteriotidis. And so essentially in a healthy mouse or individual, you would have uh, less firmicates, more bacteriotidis. And then in an obese or a, a mouse that had received a high fat diet, the firmicates would be very uh, predominant, whereas the bacteriotids would be um, uh, minoritary. And then when you gave them an antibiotic, then all of a sudden you would start to have a reversal. So you'd have less firmicates and more bacteriotitis. So again, by no means does this mean that um, uh, antibiotics are, are, are good for AMD. This was really an experimental paradigm to, to answer a question. Um, and essentially what we did was we did this model of wet age-related macular degeneration in skinny mice and obese mice and found that the obese mice had more uh, neovascularization, so more diseased blood vessel formation. Um, and then when we gave them uh, the antibiotic, this really reduced the, uh, uh, the amount of um, neovascularization. So this was a bit of a proof of concept that you know, either an antibiotic or something in your gut could, could influence a disease of the eye. Now, it didn't, however, address is the gut microbiome important? And that this is an experiment that I'll talk about towards the, at the very end of, uh, of my talk. Now, one of the main ways that the diseased blood vessels form and that all of age-related macular degeneration evolves is through a pretty solid um, inflammatory um, response. So essentially you have infiltration of these cells called mononuclear phagocytes. So there's cells that are both activated within the retina called microglial cells and um, other immune cells that come in from your blood circulation. Um, and they come and they, they start to contribute in, to this disease and they start to put all these factors, inflammatory factors that end up precipitating AMD. Now, what we found was in our paradigm where we had more um, obese, well, in the obese mice, we'd have more inflammation in the retina, whereas in mice that were either treated with the um, antibiotic or were, uh, were skinny, so regular diet, they had a lot less inflammation in their eyes. So this was a correlation um, that you know, we found and really correlated a lot with the human disease where you have a lot of inflammation, a lot of inflammatory cells that uh, accrete in, in the retina during disease. Now, how could this <clears throat> affect from your gut, so very distally, right, from your eye? Um, how, can, how can the gut influence the eye? So one of the things that we're thinking is maybe in this high-fat diet, there's more permeability, um, so your gut is actually leakier. And this is you know, something that's been um, starting to get explored now, the leaky gut concept where essentially in obesity, the junctions between your, the cells that, that close up your gut are a bit less tight. And hence you can have leakage of different bacterial factors or different toxins that could go, you know, not necessarily straight into your bloodstream, but there can be uh, a certain amount that goes into your, your circulation. So 
Uh, we did a, a model essentially to try to assess if there's more gut permeability in these high fat diets and what would happen if these uh, mice would, would um, either receive an antibiotic treatment or receive a um, fecal transfer from a skinny mouse. And essentially what we found was that the obese mice had leaky guts. When we gave them either a, an antibiotic or a fecal transfer, then we would prevent this leaky gut. Um, and this was, again, kind of um, thought provoking because it meant that something in the bacteria from the, um, from the obese mice was actually causing the gut to, to be a bit leaky. And this translated into having a lot more inflammation in those obese mice that didn't receive antibiotic or fecal transfer, so just the regular obese mice, uh, compared to the others, so either the skinny ones or the ones receiving the fecal transfer or, um, uh, or the antibiotic. Uh, so it really gave um, a paradigm where you had more obesity led to more inflammation in both the eye and uh, the bloodstream. And this was due to the bacterium inside of the, uh, the gut. Now, the final experiments we did was we took, um, again, feces from skinny mice and transferred them to the obese mice and then did the model of uh, wet age related macular degeneration where we uh, burnt a laser hole in the back of the retina and looked at uh, the amount of pathological blood vessels. So essentially what we found was with these fecal transfers, we could um, restore the gut microbiome. So if we took the microbiome, so the number of bacteriotitis and firmicates that we spoke about earlier, um, that the the firmicates are low in the skinny mice and high in the obese mice. When we would give feces from a skinny mouse to an obese mouse, their number of firmicates would actually resemble much more what you would see in a skinny mouse. So this was uh, a proof of concept that we're getting more and more um, a mouse that their gut looks like a skinny mouse when we transfer um, feces from a uh, skinny mouse to an obese mouse. So the obese mouse no longer looks like an obese mouse in terms of its uh, bacterial composition in the gut. Now, we did the, the model of age-related macular degeneration here. And uh, what we found again was that the obese mice had much more uh, pathological angiogenesis and following the fecal transfer, this was significantly reduced. So really kind of driving home the point that something in the gut microbiome, likely through the leakiness of the gut, so the production of products from these microbes would heighten the inflammatory stress in the eye. And this ultimately would lead to um, not necessarily provoking disease blood vessel growth, but if there was already a stimulus for pathological or diseased blood vessels in the retina, this would accentuate it. Now, interestingly, uh, not long after we published our study, there was uh, a human study that came out uh, where they profiled the feces of patients with uh, neovascular age-related macular degeneration and really um, quite nicely showed that exactly what we found in our mouse model uh, held true in, in patients. Uh, so we were, of course, pretty excited with that because it really kind of gave more weight to the fact that, you know, the, our findings on gut microbiome likely held true um, in patients. Um, and also since then, there's been a lot of nice work uh, out of the States um, showing that if you have uh, a heightened glycemic index, then you, you, you'll also throw off your, your gut microbiome and hence also have very similar uh, consequences as what we found with high fat diets. Uh, so again, by no means do we say that fat is bad but this is really a proof of concept to modify your gut microbiome and that this can have an impact on, on wet AMD. Now, the next steps, so we have to figure out if there are any possible therapeutic implications in here. We want to know what kind of metabolites, so what are the molecules that are produced 
by the bad microbes and can those influence uh, AMD or are there some molecules produced by good microbes and can those influence uh, AMD? Um, we also don't really know to, to a great extent what are the roles of uh, probiotics. So this is also an open field of research. Um, and then to know if we can profile um, gut microbiomes as part of a personalized medicine um, platform or, or approach. So these are the things that, that will need to be done in the upcoming years. And I think it's a pretty, pretty exciting area to be working in. Um, and so I'd like to acknowledge the people in my group that participated in this work, specifically Elizabeth Andreessen, um, who is shortly defending her PhD thesis um, and the other members of our group. So thank you very much. And I'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Sophia. That was really, really interesting. I'm gonna give you a second to catch your breath and we're gonna to get to Q and A's in just a moment. Um, and before we do, um, I want to take, take a really short pause right now to thank our supporters and our monthly donors actually. So people who have tuned in today. Um, as Morgan mentioned, I am Larissa Meniz. I'm the Director of Research and Mission Programs at Fighting Blindness Canada. And I have to say, we could not do um, all the stuff that we do without your generous support. So thank you very much. And bringing sight-saving treatments to Canada is what we do, and it's research is expensive. And as you can sort of see from Dr. Sapia's talk about all the experiments that go on, it's a long-term investment, but the results can really be life-changing. So for anyone who wants to join our community of core supporters, you can make a really big difference by joining our monthly giving program. So for as little as a dollar a day or even $10 a month, your gift will make a big impact for people who are living with vision loss. And why monthly giving? There are two main reasons. First of all, it provides a really reliable and consistent source of funding that ensures that Fighting Blindness Canada can make long-term investments in vision research. But secondly, which is also really important, is that it reduces our administrative costs so that more of your money can be directed to vision research. So please consider joining today and visit our website at fightingblindness.ca. Oh. oh, I think we may have lost, uh, lost Larissa there. Um, but we will hopefully she'll be back in a few minutes. Um, I think that uh, she was just about wrapping up anyway. So yeah, fightingblindness.ca is our website. You can definitely come there to learn more about supporting uh, the vision research that we fund. Um, so should we start with some questions? Sure. How about, uh, let's see, there's so many questions here. I have a couple from my email. Let's start here. So Tyler asks, um, he said, fasting has been known to have a lot of positive health effects, especially on the gut. Is there any relationship between fasting and eye health? Um, he, he's saying especially in relation to Stargardt's disease, but even more broadly. Yeah, so that, that's a great question. And and I think the, um, the, the answer to that is, the short answer is we don't really know yet, but there's certainly some thought-provoking studies that are coming out and including on um, ketogenic diets, you know? So, I mean, I, I think that's probably, I, I haven't seen the questions, but that, that one comes up quite readily. So I think intermittent fasting, so essentially doing, um, you know, the, the 16 hour fast and then um, eating again has, um, has had some anecdotal, um, there's some anecdotal evidence that it works. I think um, it's important that fasting will be different in every single individual. So there's no, um, you know, it's, it's hard to say how much fasting will, will be beneficial or when the benefit will start. So essentially what happens when you fast is that over the first 16 hours, um, it's, you're using up residual stores uh, so it's certainly it's certainly good residual source of energy, and then at one point, and this is where it becomes there's no dosing protocol for uh, for fasting. So essentially, it's it's maybe one of the most powerful medicines that that's out there is fasting, but we just don't know how to dose it. So we know that, for example, if you wait, if you're in a seven day fast, which is really extreme, then we're pretty sure that you're gonna 
uh, activate a lot of pathways called autophagy pathways. And so this is, this is a way that your cells start to protect um, against uh, starvation. And these pathways are known um, to essentially be uh, protective against uh, inflammation. But at the same time, we're not sure if these might actually trigger some, um, some responses in tumors. So people that have, um, that have tumors or cancer and go into starvation, we're not sure exactly how that's gonna, um, gonna respond. You know? So if essentially because those tumors uh, count on the autophagy. So that's a pretty long answer to say that we don't really know, but likely the day that we're gonna be able to dose um, uh, starvation or fasting, um, I think it'll, it'll be, there, there's a lot of kind of supporting theoretical evidence that it should work. And certainly ketogenic diets, I think is a way to, to, to kind of reach a certain type of starvation. So essentially once you starve beyond a certain amount of time, then your body starts to produce ketones and, you know, these are anti-inflammatory and so on. Um, so there's, there's certainly anecdotal evidence of people that were on ketogenic diets that had benefits. Now, ketogenic diets, depending what kind of outcome you want to have, uh, might not actually work past four or five weeks. So you need to cycle them. So I think, again, starving, uh, fasting is likely a very good approach, but we just don't yet know what's the formula. And the answer is probably going to vary from individual to individual. Okay, great. I think Larissa is back as well, uh, which is good. So I'll do one more question, then I'll turn it over to Larissa. Um, so see, actually, I have another one from my email. So AJ asked, uh, can infection or a bacteria in the gut also lead to other retinal diseases, um, for example, cone dystrophy? Is this a possible explanation for retinal diseases that are not passed down genetically, but mutated genetically? Uh, for example, I have a CRX gene for cone dystrophy and wondered if infection in the gut could be a possible trigger. And if so, how would I find that out? Yeah, so that, that's also a great question. Um, and again, the, the answer there is going to be, um, I, I don't know, but there's, um, there, there's again, a, a whole idea that once, and it doesn't necessarily have to be an infection in your gut. So that's the other important thing. Um, so there's, there's an immune memory, obviously, that occurs from uh, having different types of infections. And it's not necessarily clear whether um, some of those cells that are actually effectors in age-related macular degeneration. So those are cells that we don't, you know, the textbook don't associate with, with an immune memory. So those are called macrophages in the microglia. Those are thought to be in an arm of the immune response called the innate immune response. So they're kind of the rapid actors. Um, and in theory, they're supposed to shut off after, you know, lots of types of and, um, infections. Now, when you go into uh, a, a, an infection that is more sustained or that, you know, lasts over three to five days and, and you start to elicit an adaptive immune response, um, so essentially you start to produce antibodies or um, trigger these adaptive immune cells uh, called T cells, um, that's where the, the whole memory aspect has been best characterized. And I'd say until maybe um, two th like the late 2000, um, the late 2000s, early 2010s, it wasn't really clear that there was a, an innate memory for, for those uh, cells. So meaning if you had a previous infection, uh, would it actually prime those cells that we know cause AMD and we know cause retinal problems? Um, but we just didn't know that they could actually have a memory. And this is an active area uh, of research that's, that's really starting right now. Uh, so I could not answer your question now, but I think, I think it'll be very interesting to, you know, some of the work um, that, that certainly we're doing in the lab now tries to address this question of innate immune memory. Thanks. And uh, yeah, sorry about that. I internet problems. I just completely lost lost internet for a few moments there. So I've got um, sort of two questions. So one from one of the participants asked, you mentioned gut permeability is an issue. What about a lack of gut permeability like collagenous colitis? It has been mentioned eyesight loss is an issue with that disease. So getting any nutrients through 
a more severe case of collagen is pretty tough. So any thoughts on how a more how a transplant of fecal matter might be more effective in this issue as well. And sort of a related question to that, I was wondering if there is a link that you know between AMD and other diseases where there is a lot of potentially inflammation, like you mentioned Crohn's and colitis or depression, and are there similar things seen there? Yeah, so, so to answer the first question, like what, what's the role, how, how could a fecal transfer affect that? So I think, again, these are, so age-related macular degeneration and a lot of the retinal diseases are, are very protracted diseases. So I think it's um, the concept of a fecal transfer, I don't think would work as a treatment for AMD. You know, so I think this is an important kind of take, not take home message, but you know, the, 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 the work we presented doesn't necessarily suggest that, you know, we should all start getting fecal transfers in our fifties to prevent AMD in our in our 60s, you know, I think the the idea is that we need to have um, we need to think about gut health, you know, or, or intestinal microbes as potentially contributing to uh, to heightened um, systemic inflammation. So so I think this is that that's the the take home message. Now, if you have colitis or if you have like any type of intestinal um, uh, condition. Um, I think it's, you know, it, it becomes even more important in that case to monitor um, the gut microbes to see, you know, whether you have uh, something which I guess everyone's got a different baseline, but something that would be considered maybe more, um, more in the norm, you know, so that's, that, that would be my answer. Uh, certainly not, not thinking that uh, a fecal transfer is good for, for AMD or eye diseases, but um, it's good for, for very acute um, diseases, typically, yeah. Okay, we have a couple questions about um, the high-fat uh, high diet that you fed to the mites. Um, so someone's asking, um, was this like a plant-based fat diet or an animal-high-based uh, fat diet? And um, someone else asked, um, in this diet, are you including good fats like avocados, salmon, uh, coconut oil, those kinds of things? <laughs> No, unfortunately, we're not. Um, you know, so these are these are diets that are um, that are made for uh, for research purposes. So it would be certainly great if we could feed our mice avocados, but um, it goes with um, essentially um, these are typically animal-based fats, um, and so yeah, so they're balanced in terms of you know they're they're, they're balanced in, in terms of lipid content, um, not necessarily. Um, you know, we, we don't compare animal versus fat diets, but certainly I think there's, you know, there's evidence in these paradigms, um, a lot of evidence, for example, for omega-3 versus 6 type diets. So there's a, a lot of groups that I've been working on those. Um, and essentially in those cases, it, it seems like the omega-3 fatty acids are better for um, mitigating inflammation. And actually this is Kind of a pretty classic paradigm. The omega threes transform themselves into um, once they get metabolized into anti-inflammatory molecules, whereas the omega sixes into more pro-inflammatory. Now the problem is this hasn't really held in um, in clinic, um, and there's probably a lot of different reasons for that. Um, so a lot of the the mouse studies, and I certainly participated in some of these mouse studies. Uh, so we you know we would drive the equation to the maximum. So, you know, we'd give a ton of omega-3s or a ton of um, omega-6s and we'd see really dramatic differences. So I think probably some of what we're able to do in experimental paradigms will hold for humans, but those were very dramatic differences. Now in humans, it seems to work better. Um, and so there was a, a really big very well designed and controlled study called the ARIDS-2 study where they looked at um, essentially different supplements of, of fats like omega-3 fatty acid supplements. And they found no improvement with omega-3 fatty acids versus, um, uh, versus non-omega-3 fatty acids. And there's a couple of potential explanations for that. Um, one of them is according to some, you know, more of the 
more recent data, you need at least four grams of omega-3 fatty acids to have like a mean, meaningful impact um, in a human. So four grams per day, which is kind of like at the who's. So who doesn't have um, like a toxicity dose for omega-3 fatty acids, but they kind of say, you know, between three and four uh, grams per day is, is maximal. And so, so some people have shown that with these very high doses, you start to see some, you know, cardiovascular um, improvements, but, you know, that's a, that's a, a big dose. Um, so, so yeah, so that's one thing, but what does seem to help, and there are studies that have shown this, was that eating fish, um, so there's a big nurse study essentially that looked at, you know, retrospectively who, who eats the most fish, and they had the least amount of wet AMD. So there's something that fish confer that pills of omega-3s don't, you know, so I think this is a, an important take-home message too, so it's not necessarily the pill that's going to have an impact as much as eating fish. And if you're eating fish, perhaps you're not, you know, your peripheral diet is also maybe a bit different than, you know, if you're eating meats and, um, and a, a very heavy red meat or meat-based uh, diet. Thanks. I had a um, friend who always used to say when talking about nutrition or supplements that it was all about the food matrix. So it wasn't just about like the um, one thing or the other. And so you really have to look at what else is bound up in like in fish or in, in your diet and stuff like that. And that really stuck with me. Yeah, yeah. We have a question from Min, which I think is, um, is, is pretty important about, so I have gluten sensitivity and I was told that it causes inflammation throughout the body. Is this the same kind of inflammation that could be behind AMD? And I feel like we hear a lot about inflammation in the news and about it being either bad or good. So yeah. can you speak to that a bit? Yeah, sure. So, I mean, inflammation um, at its onset is a very good thing, right? So, I mean, we've, we've kind of um, evolved as all of us can deal with, with bacterial infections really well compared to you know, people that were there two million years ago. So we were selected for uh, the people that could best fight off bacterial infections. Um, and, you know, hence right now we're, we're in a state where this, um, as we age, um, this immune system starts to get more and more active, you know. And, and another thing is, you know, for example, there's some really super interesting work um, that's looking at sex differences and the fact that you know, women might actually be better at fighting off infections because of their their uh, double X chromosome, and so a lot of inflammatory genes are actually there. Um, so, but then women have more autoimmune disease. You know, so there's like um, there's a trade off somewhere of how much inflammation is good or not. Um, but certainly, uh, you know, the kind of blunt uh, type of inflammation and immunity that. Uh, and even adaptive immunity that clears infections is, is a very good thing. Uh, no one can argue against that. Um, and same thing, you know, something that we don't necessarily associate inflammation with is tissue repair. But that's the main, that's one of the main roles of, of your immune system is not just to fight off infections, but it's also to repair damaged tissue, you know. So if you, if you have um, uh, some sort of, um, you know, tear in an internal tissue, uh, or if you have like a damage to your retina, for example, or or whatnot, I mean, you're gonna you're gonna have these these little microglial cells and so on that their their main thing is to clean up the area, you know, to make sure that the tissue functions appropriately. So inflammation is very good, you know. There's no there's no doubt. Now the problem is uh, chronic inflammation, and that's you know like with anything, it, it, it becomes a, a bad issue. Uh, so if you're gluten um, insensitive and you have a heightened level of, you know, systemic inflammation um, continuously, uh, you know, I, I mean, I, I don't know the, uh, the link between AMD and gluten intolerance, but um, it sounds to me like if there's ways of, of keeping that down um, over the long term, so again, there, there's no like one trigger, this is kind of like a progressive series of hits, um, I, I would think it would be a, you know, obviously a good idea to, to, to keep it in check.
Absolutely. We have so many questions. Um, unfortunately, we're not going to have enough time for all of them today. But uh, if we don't get your question, um, myself or our health information officer, Sherry, will get back to you um, with an answer. Um, but I do want to just have one more question. I think this is a good way to end out. So Catherine is asking, what is the next step in your research? Yeah, well, that's thank you for asking that. Um, so actually, it, it's exactly what one of the uh, earlier um, people ask so about this uh, whether you can trigger um, in, innate immune memory you know so whether having infections in early life can affect uh, the development of these diseases and we've got some I think pretty exciting data um, where we where we look at immune cells and so from from mice or individuals that had an infection in early life and then these cells that you know, typically you aren't supposed to have changes in later life. They actually have very profound changes and they're ready to fire much more readily, meaning they're ready to attack. So they're kind of primed because of this infection that happened in early life. So, um, so this is what we're quite interested in now, trying to molecularly understand what are the triggers for this, this type of new immune memory and how it can impact diseases of aging like AMD um, and diabetic retinopathy to a certain extent. So that's, that's certainly the, what, what we're, you know, thinking about in the mornings and the evenings <laughs> and working on in the lab right now. Yeah. Right. Well, thank you so much for joining us. And again, I apologize sure. if we didn't get your questions, but we will uh, we'll respond. But um, thank you so much for sharing um, this research. Every time I hear about this research, it's always so exciting. I think people really hear the word fecal transplant or like what <laughs> it, it, it was a lot of weird conversations in the lab when uh, we're building this this paradigm <laughs> absolutely well it's fascinating stuff and uh thank you again for sharing with us today